about the meeting rules. This meeting is being live streamed on Southwark's YouTube channel and the recording will be available after the meeting. Please note, all guests will have their microphone muted when they join the meeting. You'll be asked to remain on mute unless I ask you to speak. Uh, for example, in the three minute slot reserved for objectors, the applicant, supporters, and of course, ward councillors. Please do not switch off, switch on your microphone unless I give you permission to speak. Attendees who are using the telephone dialing function on a smartphone are also, not, are also muted. If I ask you to speak, please dial uh, asterisk six to unmute yourself. Now, to ensure this virtual meeting runs smoothly, only one individual will be allowed to speak at any one time. Uh, any person speaking must be permitted to finish what they're saying without interruption. Um, if I request an individual stop speaking, they should do so immediately. Into interruptions may result in you being disconnected from the meeting. If a member of the committee wishes to speak, could I ask them to indicate this via the raised hand symbol or the message board? Now, members of the public are reminded that the message board is not for public use. Any message left on the message board by members of the public will be disregarded by committee members. Bearing in mind that this meeting is live streamed and that a recording will be available on the Council's YouTube channel, if you're planning to speak, you may choose to switch off your camera so your voice only will be heard. Members of the public who are disconnected from the meeting due to technical difficulties should use the link or dining instructions they were sent initially to return to the meeting. Members of the public are welcome to record, screenshot or tweet the public proceedings of the meeting. A copy of the Council's protocol for reporting and filming is available on the Council's website. During the meeting, members of the committee will not access the internet except as it relates to the official business of the meeting, send or receive emails, text messages, or tweet the, the business concerning the, the, the meeting and to anyone outside this meeting. Please note that members may be accessing the agenda via the internet, will be taking a five minute break uh, every, every, uh, off every hour and reconvening immediately thereafter. Now, I'd like to ask officers to introduce themselves and explain their role at this meeting. I'll begin with the planning officers, and I'll begin with the director, Simon. Would you introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm Simon Bevan. I'm the director of planning at Southwark, and I'm here to advise the committee generally on planning matters. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask uh, Dipesh Patel? Thank you, Chair. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sipesh Patel. I manage the major applications and new home scheme and planning, and, and I'm here to advise uh, and assist on item 6.2 um, for the um, Kais Hospital application. Thank you. Uh, Michael Takaris. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm Michael Takaris. I'm Group Manager, Design and Conservation, and I'm here for um, it, it, to speak on uh, in respect of uh, six, item 6.1 and 6.2. Thank you very much. Uh, Yvonne Lewis. Oh, you're muted, Yvonne, sorry. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that, technical problem. Um, I'm Yvonne Lewis, I'm the Strategic Applications Manager and I'm here to assist if required on the first item, the Southern Cove Station development. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia Watson. I am talking to you, please. You're on mute, yep, there you are. Uh, my name's Sonia Watson. It's EPL, that's BL. Uh, one moment, Sonia. Can I ask all, all those uh, listening to the meeting, can you mute your, um, your microphones? Thank you, Sonia, go ahead. Okay, uh, my name's Sonia Watson. I'm here to present the second item, 6.2 for Guy's Hospital. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Terence McLennan. Hello, I'm Terence McLeod and I'm one of the team leaders in the strategic applications team and I'm the case officer and presenting for the first item. Thank you very much. Um, Alex Ayabaya. Thank you, Chair. I'm Alex Ayabaya. I'm team leader at Transport Planning. I'm here to uh, talk uh, to represent uh, from the highway and transportation perspectives on both development proposals on the agenda. Thank you very much. I see I've now completed the planning. I now move on to legal. Excuse me, oh. Councillor. Oh. It's uh, 
I'll introduce oh, myself okay. if that's yes, okay. It's, uh, it, it's Martin Mackay. I'm a design and conservation team leader. Leader, I think myself and Michael Sukara are doubling up um, a oh. little bit, but, uh, but I will deal, I hope, with the design side um, on item 6.1. Very good, thank you. I'm sorry I've missed you there. Uh, okay. now, um, if I may now move on to legal, and I've got up uh, John Gorse, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Uh, my name is John Gorse. Uh, uh, I'm a solicitor with Solar Council, and I'll be advising members uh, in relation to legal and governance matters this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, assume there are no other legal persons. Uh, I'll now move on to uh, the clerk, um, uh, Prinam Patel. Thank you, Chair. My name is Poonam Patel. I'm the Constitutional Officer and Clerk for this meeting. I'm here to minute the meeting and to advise on the procedures for hearing the items and on decision making. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, I note here tech support. This is interesting. Tim. Tim Murdoch. <laughs> Good evening. Um, yes, uh, Tim Murphy, the constitutional team providing uh, digital tech support, and I may also provide uh, advice on procedures. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I hope I've now covered all officers. Thank you very much. In that case, now I'll now begin the meeting and formally item one, our apologies. I believe there are no apologies. We have a full house. Thank you. I'll now move on to item two, confirmation of voting members. I'll now ask members of the committee to confirm that they are a voting members of the committee. And I'll begin with the vice chair, uh, Councillor Morell. Uh, can you confirm you are a, a voting member? Thank you, Chair. I am a voting member. Thank you. Councillor uh, Richard Livingstone, can you confirm you are a voting member? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I can confirm I'm a voting member. Very good. Councillor uh, David O'Brien, can you confirm you are a voting member? Voting member, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleo Soames, can you confirm you're a voting member? Good evening, Chair. Yes, I'm a voting member. I can confirm. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dan Whitehead, can you confirm you're a voting member? Yes, I am, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kath Whittam, can you confirm you're a voting member? Voting member, Chair. And Councillor Bill Williams, can you confirm you are a voting member? Voting member, Chair. Very good. I'm Councillor Martin Seaton. I'm also a voting member of the committee. Thank you. I'll now move on to item three on, on the agenda. It is notification of any item of business, which a, ch a chair deems urgent, of course, members, you should now have in your possession the supplemental agenda one con container containing the members pack, presentation pack, and of course, at the addendum report relating to items 6.1 and 6.2. Can you can confirm you're in receipt? Yes. To indicate. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. In that case, I'll now move on to uh, item four on the agenda, which is disclosure of interest and dispensation. Does any member wish to declare any interest or dispensation in respect of any item or issue to be discussed at this meeting? Are there any declarations? None? Oh, I can't still yeah. that. yes, yes. Uh, in relation to item 6.2, um, my partner is a consultant at Guy and St. Thomas's Trust. And therefore, I have an interest. All righty. Um, can I just take some of my thank you for that declaration? I'm not sure we received that previously. I wonder if um, uh, uh, the clerk or John, yep, uh, John Coles wish to comment. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, we, 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 I don't think we were aware of, um, uh, of that before. Uh, it's very much up to you, Councillor Whitehead, as to um, uh, whether or not uh, uh, you think that you can sit on um, that particular application. Uh, that will depend largely as to um, uh, the extent of, of your partner's interest. Um, uh, and uh, without, without, without knowing that, um, uh, all I would say, it sounds as though it might be a tr bit tricky for you. It's your decision. Um, but uh, you know they're they're clearly an employee. They're getting a salary, salary, and, and it therefore could be said uh, that you've got some kind of financial interest. But um, uh, yeah, um, vision, but I, I'd, be, I'd be wary of it, obviously. So, so the reason, yeah, th thank you. Um, the reason I didn't mention it sooner is because I I wasn't aware of the full implications of what the building related to until discussing it with her. Um, having discussed it with her and given her role in the trust. Specifically, she is an acute medicine consultant who may work in that building in the future. While there's no certainty of that, it is a possibility. Um, I do think that it may be a problem. 
Okay. Uh, uh, I think if I if I may, um, Councillor Whitehead, um, um, that there is a, uh, and I'll take guidance from the uh, legal officer, if, if there is a pecuniary interest, that is a particular concern. Uh, and I, I, I'm not comfortable under those circumstances. And um, I, I would seek uh, further guidance from the legal officers. Um, and I know that you've, as you've now declared that you've already become aware of the extent. Uh, and I'm wondering if there is a, a, a person in the audience, uh, Council Whitehead or Council Bryan, who is a, a potential substitute. Is there a potential substitute nearby? If not, um, um, no, uh, no, Chair, we haven't set a reserve up. We didn't realise that we were going to need to. Sorry. Uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, again, I've taken advice from legal and, and the clerk, of course, in respect of, of these matters, but um, there, there does appear to be a, a pecuniary interest to your household. Um, and this is a matter, therefore, that will have a, a direct impact on yourself. My recommendation. Um, and I'll, I'll leave to colleague members to make further comment if they wish, uh, that you should not sit on this item. Uh, but uh, I'll leave it to your immediate view, but I, if indeed you are legally trained yourself, so, uh, I think you I think you, you, you also appreciate why I'm making that recommendation. Um, is, is that acceptable to you? And, I mean, Chair, uh, as mentioned, it, it, it is the decision of Councillor Whitehead. Indeed, indeed, um, indeed. But, but, but since um, he, he said that his partner is an employee, maybe working in, in, in uh, the building, but I think the fact that uh, they are an employee is the, um, uh, is the factor. And, and mm -hmm. um, you know, from that point of view, as you, as you rightly say, the household does get a, a financial benefit. So as I said to, to Councillor Whitehead earlier, I'd, I'd be very wary uh, of, of sitting in sitting on, the, on that particular application, although it is his decision. Um, yeah, agreed. I think it may be best if I don't sit on the application and apologies for, to the committee for not informing them sooner. It only, in retrospect, occurred to me that this may be an issue. Okay. I, I'm, I'm most grateful. I'm most grateful. Uh, I, if I may just take further advice from the clerk and, and from the legal officer. So, of course, item is a second item, so of course you're fine for the first item. Uh, uh, and it, it's possible that uh, in the interim, uh, yourself or your colleague might um, uh, identify a, uh, a, a reserve. Would that be appropriate during the, during the time of the meeting, John, um, Tim, or others? Uh, my, my feeling is that would be a bit awkward because they, they right. won't read the papers or, or the- Fair enough. And, uh, Fair enough. Point of view, I, I think it would be preference would be not. I'm, 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 I'm quite happy to, to bow to your advice. Um, in that case, in kind of Whitehead, that's duly noted, uh, but you are, of course, able to sit for the first item. Thank you. And thank you for your declaration. So important that we uh, get that right as early as possible. And uh, our, our decisions are therefore robust and will, will sustain challenges if, if necessary. Um, if I may then, thank you for that, that declaration. Notwithstanding that declaration, are there any other declarations that I, I should, or we, the committee, should be made aware? Uh, Vice Chair, can anyone tell it? Any other declarations? I wish to now to be very cautious. <laughs> no? In no, that no. case, very good. Thank you very much. In that case, I'm, I will I'll now move on, and move on, and thank you, Councillor Whitehead, um, to item five on the agenda, which is minutes. And of course, colleague, these are pages um, six to nine of the main agenda pack. Uh, but um, before we go on to that, um, can we approve uh, uh, minutes? Uh, can we approve these minutes have been a correct record of the meeting held on the sixth of January, twenty twenty one? Are they agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In that case, then, I'll now move on to item six which is the de development management. And for the audience, the next item of business concerned the determination of planning application. I would like to remind everyone of the committee's guidance and conduct of business. Officers will present the report, outline their recommendations, answer questions raised by the committee. If present wishing to speak, the following may then address the committee for no more than three minutes each. 
a spokesperson representing any objector to the application, by now you'd need to identify a single spokesperson, and if more than one objector wishes to speak, the time will be divided accordingly within the three minute time slot. Followed by the applicants or their agents, followed by a spokesperson representing any support of the applications who live within 100 metres of the development site. And last but not least, the award councillor representing the area affected by the proposals. Each speaker should restrict their comments to the planning aspect of the proposals and should, should avoid repeating information which is already in the committee report. The meeting is not a hearing where all participants present evidence to be examined by other participants. At the end of each representation, the committee may ask questions of the presenter. Speakers should lead the, the committee on subject which they would welcome further questioning. Um, ward members in attendance and those nominated to speak on behalf of objectors, supporters, applicants may, ask, may be asked further questions. Um, brief contributions in any case, uh, may be asked further questions. Brief contributions in any case need to be clarified after they've addressed the meetings. Now, this, this will not be an opportunity to take part in the debate of the committee. After receiving all submissions, the committee will debate the applications and consider the recommendations. This is a council committee meeting which is open to the public, but there should be no interruptions for members of the public. Finally, I would like everyone present to know that although the committee, uh, planning committee comprises members of different political parties, we are not politically whipped. Our decisions are made in accordance with the council planning policy and based upon the information contained in the relevant report, together with the consultation responses and any verbal submission made today. How we approach these uh, applications set out in the development management report at item eight. And if members are happy to note the report, we move on to considering the planning applications. Are you content members? Yes, Chair. Very good, thank it's you good. very much. Thank you very much. I now move on to item 6.1, which is the development management application, um, applications uh, 20 AP 1189 for four planning applications. The address is the Southwark Underground Station, the cut, 60 to 70 Blackfriars Road, London SE 18JZ. And of course, members, this is pages 18 to 124 of the agenda pack and pages 1 to 8 of the addendum report. Can I ask, invite the considering officer uh, to uh, make their presentation? Please, would you introduce yourself? Thank you, Chair. I'm Terence McLeod, and I'm the, one of the team leaders in the strategic applications team and the case officer and presenting for the first item. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Item one refers to the application known as the Overstation Development, which intends to develop the land at and around Southwark Underground Station. Southwark Underground Station was opened around 20 years ago and was designed and constructed to enable it to be subsequently built over. Numerous options have been developed over the years to construct a new building above the station, but they have been hampered by constraints such as the cost and engineering of keeping the Underground Station open and operational during construction, and the fact that the relatively small size of the underground station could only accommodate a small office floor plate, which would not result in a deliverable scheme. Given the limited area above the existing station and the difficulties in constructing a lift and service court above the voids of the station and tracks, TfL explored the options for expanding the potential development area. In 2018, TfL acquired both Algarve House, known as Platform Suburb, and five leasehold flats at Stiles House. Concurrently, the Stiles House Tenants Management Organisation were in discussions with the Council's Housing Department to look at options for providing additional affordable housing on their estate. In other conversations with the Council, the potential to incorporate the area of Jones Street into a development site was also raised. This would require the formal stopping up of Jones Street. On the 30th of April 2019, Cabinet authorised the Director of Regeneration to enter into a land exchange agreement with TfL, which was formally signed on the 11th of August 2020. The land exchange provides the legal framework for creating two separate parcels of land on which TfL can then construct their office development and the Council can build a block of 25 new homes. In addition to the land exchange, the Council will receive staged payments linked to the progress of the relevant statutory consents, including planning and the stopping up of Jones Street. 
The image here shows the land swap. Um, the area in green was Southwark owned land and the area in pink was TfL owned land. And the image at the bottom shows how the sites have been rationalised so that it, um, it provides to um, more uh, developable land parcels. The land exchange agreement requires some buildings currently on the site to be demolished. These are the platform building, the walk-up garages, the existing TMO hall and 49 to 56 Hatfields, which is a two-storey block of eight studio dwellings within the Sells House estate, sometimes referred to as the Chalets. Seven of these are let by the Council on Secure Tenancies. The other one was sold under right to buy registration and the lease is now held by TfL. TfL also hold the leases of four other flats that have been sold under the right to buy in the main Styles House Tower building. And these will be transferred to the Council under the Land Exchange Agreement, enabling four secure Council tenants to relocate. The application to develop the new affordable housing and the TMO hall has been um, was presented to the Planning Committee on the 22nd of February. At this meeting, the Planning Committee resolved to grant permission, subject to referral to Mayor of London, and the completion of a legal agreement. Now, the current application that you're reviewing tonight has been submitted by TfL. The application covers the land above and adjacent to Southwark Underground Station, including Jones Street, and the part of the land which is currently within the Styles House Estate. The site is further bounded by Isabella Street and the railway viaduct to the north. Isabella Street contains a vibrant mix of small food and beverage units within the railway arches. Blackfriars Road forms the eastern boundary and the Transport for London Palestra office sits directly opposite the site. To the south, the site is bounded by the Cut, which is largely commercial at street level with homes above commercial premises. The surrounding area is mixed use with homes, offices, education, bars, restaurants and retails. In terms of townscape, building heights range from two to five storeys on the cut, rising to 12 storeys at Styles House on Hatfields, and the taller Palestra building on the corner of Blackfriars Road and Union Street. The site is not located within a conservation area and there are no listed buildings on or adjoining the site. Within Southwark, the nearest conservation areas to the application site are Valentine Place and King's Bench. Both of these conservation areas sit to the south of the site, close to Blackfriars Road. Within the London Borough of Lambeth, the Rappel Street, Waterloo and Mitre Road conservation areas lie to the west and north of the application site. The proposed development would result in the demolition of Algarve, Algarve House and 49 to 56 Hatfields. In order to redevelop the land above the underground station to deliver a 17 storey building comprising new offices and flexible retail class A1, A2, A3 and A4. The new office building would have a stepped form, rising to a maximum of 17 storeys, with new retail units at ground floor level on the cut. The station entrance would remain unaffected and the station would remain in use throughout the construction period, um, with the exception of possible temporary closures when some key activities not compatible with safe access to the station need to take place. The delivery of the development will require the stopping up of Jones Street, in order to create a single unified site for the proposed development with an efficient building footprint and optimised core position outside of the station box. The development would release part of the current TFO, TFL owned land to enable the delivery of the new housing and the TMO hall under the land swap. And this would also create a green space, um, a, a no build zone um, between, um, between the new styles house housing and the office building. And that's the area that's Hatched and hatched in red on the plan shown. At ground level of the new building, there will be two retail units facing onto the cut, in addition to the main reception and the lift lobby. Affordable workspace would be provided at ground, first and second floor level. At the upper levels, the building would be used for class B1 office space. The scheme also includes two basement levels, which contain planned equipment, basement cycle parking for occupiers of the building. The roof level accommodates additional plant and air source heat pumps. In land use terms, the proposed development would result in a significant uplift in employment floor space, which is supported in the central activity zone and the opportunity area within which the site is located. The development would provide an uplift of 25,601 square metres of 
employment floor space and would support up to 2,000 new jobs, which is welcomed. The development would also include 2,652 square metres of affordable workspace, which represents 10% of the total office floor space being proposed and therefore meets the, the quantum aspect of the affordable workspace policy. This affordable workspace would be provided at ground floor level, shown here in purple, first floor level, and there would be a portion of it provided at second floor level as well. The affordable workspace would be secured on affordable terms with a 30% reduction on market rent levels for a period of 30 years, and this will be secured as part of the Section 106 agreement. Now, as mentioned previously, the development would result in the stopping up of Jones Street. Jones Street currently connects the cut to Hatfields, passing beneath the railway viaduct and provides access to Colombo House, which is occupied by British Telecom, and the rear of the Isabella Street retail units. And the plan that's shown on the screen just now shows the portion of Jones Street um, that would be stopped up. It's the, the area that's hatched in black. Uh, so it's the southern part of Jones Street which connects to the cut. The closure of Jones Street has been raised by some occupiers on Isabella Street as well as BT, um, and they've expressed concerns mainly resting on how their sites would be serviced. As worth pointing out, there's a southern section of Jones Street which would need to be stopped up. The access to Colombo House and the Isabella Street businesses would be maintained from the northern leg of Jones Street. The applicant has undertaken traffic surveys, surveys which demonstrate that Jones Street is lightly trafficked and that the majority of vehicles using it are servicing vehicles for the businesses, including the retail units on Isabella Street and Colombo House, which is an important BT asset. The applicant has undertaken various studies that demonstrate that the servicing of these businesses can continue with the proposed new layout. The portion of Jones Street just south of the railway viaduct would remain open and would provide turning space for vehicles as well as a route to the new, the, the new OSD building to provide on-site servicing as shown in this image here. Um, the two red arrows point to the vehicular access to this loading bay, so all servicing could take place on site. The proposed, the proposed site layout, including the vehicular access points, position of buildings in relation to highways, and the improvement to the footway on the cut, which is shown here. Um, so this demonstrates that the, the pavements along the cut will be widened as part of the development. Um, the proposed development minimise car parking whilst encouraging walking and cycling, which supports the council's sustainability agenda. The site has excellent access to public transport and the development has been shown to have a very limited impact on the public transport network in terms of vehicle trips and the proposed servicing arrangements would minimise any highway impacts. Whilst the closure of Jones Street would have some impacts on pedestrian permeability, these are not considered to be significant. However, the ability to implement any planning permission will be dependent on the applicant securing a stopping up order for the southern leg of Jones Street. This is outside of the planning process and is a decision of the highway authority. In design terms, the proposed development at 17 storeys would be slightly taller than the 70 metres set out in the SPD, with the total height proposed being 75.14 metres. This includes office accommodation, um, the, the, the development includes office accommodation up to 70 metres, and an enclosed plant area above, creating a maximum overall height of just over 75 metres. As such, the overall height is slightly higher than that envisaged in the Blackfriars Road SPD. However, this limited additional height would not lead to any additional townscape or amenity issues, and as such, is considered acceptable. The building would form a very distinctive pairing with the Palestra building, facing each other across the wide carriageway of Blackfriars Road. The pair are isolated from large buildings towards the bridgehead, Whilst to the south, the character of Backfriars Road is defined more by large listed townhouses on the west side and the blocks of the Nelson Square estate, and the newer offices, which, which establish a scale of up to 10 storeys in height on the east side. The landmark status of the new building will therefore be all the more evident. This localised point of scale was envisaged in the Backfriars Road SPD. Whilst it's acknowledged that the building would have considerable mass, this mass is complex and interesting. Um, the footprint of the building will fold around the circular underground building in order to preserve the prominence of the curved underground station entrance and maintains a generous entrance to Isabella Street between the building and the railway line to the north, which is a very vibrant part of the low wing project. 
The folding of the ground floor plan form is then extruded upwards to produce a multifaceted building of considerable interest. This breaks down the feeling of bulk to an extent and each facade will catch the light in a different way, meaning that the appearance of the building will change throughout the day. Further interest is added by a series of dramatic terraces on the western facade, which you can see on this um, image here and more effectively on this one. Um, this is a prominent feature in views along the cut from the west and in the outlook eastwards from the Styles House building. And these terraces will be planted to create a garden effect. As can be seen from the images, the proposed building will be a colourful one. The flutes of the solid vertical panels will be coloured to match the colours of the various underground lines, with the northern facades featuring the cooler colours of the Piccadilly, Victoria and Docklands lines, through to the warmer greens and yellows of the circling district lines as one moves around the building, to reds, yellows and purples of the central, overground and metropolitan lines on the southern facade. And again, this change in colour as one moves around the building reinforces the multifaceted architectural concept of the design. The colour adds interest without becoming garish or overly dominant. The terraces on the west side of the building are a key part of the overall aesthetic. The dramatic form of the building imparted by this feature will be reinforced with planting. And the planting itself will vary according to height on the building with the war, therefore darker tiers having a forest floor theme which will give way to the valley, meadow and grassland planting, and then alpine forest as one goes up the building. Behind the edge planting, each terrace will provide generous outdoor areas for tenants of the building. Overall, the facades and forms of the building constitute an integrated aesthetic concept, which alludes to the building's position at a key transport node, and which will be fully climate responsive. Overall, therefore, the form and aesthetic of the building envelope befits the building's intended role as a local landmark, and it will be one of considerable interest and quality. The scheme proposes extensive landscaping for the area adjacent to Isabella Street, and whilst this will not be a new public space, it will be more accessible, more usable, and will be a more interesting and attractive space to spend time in and pass through. The eyelid is to be integrated as a feature with tiered landscaping and seating around its perimeter. As previously mentioned, the building has been designed to be climatically responsive, with facades designed to minimise overheating. Furthermore, the use of heat pumps as well as other bee lean and bee queen measures will result in a carbon reduction of 42%, which exceeds the minimum 35% requirement. It should also be noted that the development will be making a contribution of £544,350 to the Carbon Offset Fund, and as such, the scheme will effectively achieve carbon zero. In terms of amenity impacts, it's noted that there would be impacts on daylight and sunlight. The developing sites in highly urbanised environments often results in some unavoidable impacts to daylight and sunlight. Recognising the challenges associated with developing inner city sites, the numerical targets given in the BRE are expected to be treated with a degree of flexibility, having due regard for the existing and emerging context within which these sites are located. And this application site is located within a central London opportunity area. In this instance, the site has been designated as an appropriate location for a tall building above 70 metres in height. The Blackfriars Road SPD accepts the principle of a tall building in this location in order to provide a focal point to the existing Southwark Underground Station, as does the Blackfriars Road area vision of the new Southwark plan. The most affected properties for daylight and sunlight are one, the cut, and to a lesser extent, Ring Court. The daylight assessment shows that a small number of windows and homes would experience significant reductions in the amount of daylight, and this would be classified as a major impact. Sunlight is not affected due to the orientation. Looking at the nature of the rooms affected, many are bedrooms, where the primary use means that the BRE gives these rooms a lower expectation in terms of daylight. Other affected rooms are small kitchens, which are not recognised as habitable rooms under the suburb plan. The flats in Ring Court are dual aspect with their principal living rooms on the south facade, which is unaffected. However, it must be acknowledged that the small number of flats at one the cut would have both living and bedroom spaces affected. This harm should be recognised and given weight in the, term, in the determination of the application. On balance, though, officers consider that when reading the BRE guidance with the required flexibility and in view of the positive benefits of the development proposal, the degree of harm to a limited number of dwellings um, would not justify withholding planning permission in this case. In terms of outlook and privacy, the development would achieve the minimum separation distances required by the Residential Design Standards SPD. Um, the distance would be met for all existing dwellings and it would actually increase 
um, as the building gets taller because the, the design of the building with the terraces means that the separation distance between um, the closest point of the building and Styles House and the new dwellings at Styles House would increase the, the higher up the building we go. But even at its closest point, it, it complies with the SPD in terms of the separation distances. The development would require a section one of six agreement and hence the terms set out in table at paragraph 224 of the committee report have been agreed. This would also include the requirement to enter into a section 278 agreement for the work set out under paragraph 226. Additionally, an estimated mural sill payment of £5,468,719 and a subic sill payment of £2,690,396 would be due. And this is a material local financial consideration. The applicant has undertaken a detailed and comprehensive programme of engagement with the community and local stakeholders. In addition to this, the Council have consulted 2,468 local residents and 43 objections have been received, primarily setting out concerns in relation to height, scale and massing, daylight and sunlight and land use issues. The table at paragraph 17 of the report sets out the main points of the objections, along with the number of times they've been raised, and a further detailed breakdown of the objections is set out in paragraph 245. In conclusion, the intention to redevelop the land around the Summer Underground Station site for a commercial scheme with a tall building is one that is supported by current and emerging planning policy and the Blackfriars Road SPD. The substantial uplift in employment space through the creation of high quality offices and the provision of new retail opportunities that will arrive in the streets whilst supporting the functions of the district town centre is consistent with the new suburb plan site allocation and the objectives for the opportunity area. The development would provide a substantial uplift in employment for space to create up to 2,000 new jobs in a location highly accessible by various modes of public transport and by bike. The provision of affordable workspace work, work will secure low cost space for micro to medium sized enterprises. The immediate townscape is varied with lower rise buildings on the cut and taller buildings located to the east and north of the site on Blackfriars Road. The development plan expects tall buildings to be located in areas which have the highest accessibility to public transport and the Blackfriars Road SPD specifically identifies this site as being suitable for a landmark tall building. The building would, along with the Palestra building opposite, mark this important point in the long Blackfriars Road Boulevard. The building would be of the highest design quality and would incorporate climate mitigation measures and planting into its design language. Whilst there would be public realm improvements such as the quality landscaping scheme proposed around Isabella Street and the Eyelid, in addition to the widened pavement woods on the cut, it is acknowledged that the closure of Jones Street would result in reduced pedestrian permeability. However, this is considered acceptable on balance given the site-specific circumstances and the need to unlock the Styles House site to develop new affordable housing. The ability to develop the Styles House site for additional affordable housing is reliant on this development and the associated land swap agreement. The approval of this overstation development will majority fund the provision of the 25 affordable homes on the Styles House site. It's fully acknowledged that it would be significant impacts in terms of daylight and sunlight to a small number of homes and recognising the challenges associated with developing inner city site, it's in the, the BRE expects these sites to be treated with a degree of flexibility. Having considered the number of rooms affected, the use of the rooms and the setting, as well as the context of the wider benefits of the development, it's concluded that it would not be reasonable to refuse planning permission on the basis of the immunity impacts. The impacts identified in the application documents and through officer assessment in this report should be considered in determining the application. No impacts of a significant scale have been identified which are not capable of being mitigated through detailed design, through conditions or through provisions in the Section 106 agreement. The application is considered to be in compliance with the development plan and emerging documents when read as a whole and it is therefore recommended that planning permission be granted subject to conditions, the completion of a Section 106 agreement and referral to Mayor of London as well as having regard for the, um, the amendment set out in the addendum. That's it. Yep. Very good. Thank you very much indeed Doug, for that. Um, are there any questions from members of the committee, first of all? Any points of clarification? Uh, in that case, I might ask a, a quick question on, on the London plan. 
and and does the um, uh, the approval of the London plan impact this application? Uh, the, when we assessed the application um, originally before the London plan was adopted, we give full consideration to the London plan policies. Um, so uh, the, despite the fact that the London plan was adopted very shortly after the report was published, um, the development isn't contrary to um, the, London, the new London plan. Thank you. I, I can just double check in relation to carbon offset. You, you indicated there was a substantial sum of five, uh, half a million pounds, just over half a million pounds. Uh, I'm trying to just first of all double check the percentages that are quoted in the London plan in relation to carbon offset. You said 35% here. Is the London plan a higher or lower figure? The London plan is 35%. Uh, and now, um, as part of the new London plan, uh, the developments have to um, become carbon zero. So previously it was the, resi the residential parts of developments that had to make a payment to bring them up to carbon zero and that wasn't applied to commercial schemes but under the new London plan that's applied to commercial schemes um, which is why the developers making um, the, the payment of half a million. Uh, that's understood. Um, for the, just for the clarification because I suspect this will be a recurring theme, but it, it does appear to be quite a different in terms of the, the threshold. Uh, and it's, and it's as future developments are expected to be carbon zero. Um, I, and I am, and we members are, of course, considering this application on its individual merits. Uh, can you, are you able to recall, maybe the director can recall an application which we've um, achieved a 100% uh, uh, Come carbon neutral. Uh, there have been no offset payment required because they've achieved one percent. Can you? I'm, I'm, I'm having difficulty recording if that's happened, but, but maybe someone or yourself could respond to my, my question. Tower Bridge Road. Number oh, one let, let, let the director. Let the director respond. Uh, Thank you, Cadu. Uh, I, I've got a follow up. You see. <laughs> uh, Chair, no, I, I'm. I'm. Councillor Whitton may have a better memory of these things than me. I, I'm. I was. I'm not sure that we have actually achieved full carbon neutral on site. But um, I don't know whether uh, Yvonne or Michael might also um, uh, have other information, but I, I, I think uh, that's still something that um, will become uh, an aim to achieve in the future, but is not routinely achieved yet. Uh. Oh, I did. It, it, this will definitely be, and thank you, Kaz Whitton, for that intervention. <laughs> uh, notwithstanding that intervention, I might add, uh, it, it does seem to be an interesting threshold we're seeking to, to achieve. Um, so my, my final question on this, on this matter is that uh, £532,000 appear to be a substantial sum, um, but uh, can, can someone explain how that... Um, amount is calculated and is sort of confident that we are able to, to devise a scheme uh, that would ensure that a, a, a scheme that will ensure that we are achieving carbon neutrality. Uh, Chair, um, the, uh, we are required to uh, carry out further work to, to establish an appropriate carbon offset payment. So far, what, we're, what we've done is we have uh, revised our carbon offset payment from the one that Southwark adopted um, a few years ago to the London plan one, which is 95 pounds. Further work is 95 pounds per tonne. Further work is being done uh, now to establish whether that is um, <clears throat> The, the right level of payment to offset a tonne of carbon. Uh, we are aware that some boroughs have concluded that a higher payment is appropriate, um, uh, but that work is gonna be done in conjunction with the climate emergency strategy, which is expected to come to cabinet in June. Uh, the climate emergency strategy will also set out 
much more guidance for us, which we are we don't have at the moment. Guidance for us as to uh, how to use the carbon offset because there are a very wide range of different sorts of projects, as you'll appreciate, which could be uh, where this funding could be used to offset carbon, to save carbon emissions or even other greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, that's going to be available to us, as I said, in June. And from then on, we'll be able to make more confident recommendations to the planning committee if necessary, if it uh, goes above the £100,000 threshold for individual projects, uh, or if it is indeed delegated to officers. But um, what we need is um, a strategy, and that's coming in June. All righty. So this will, will certainly be an, a recurring theme, and for members who have unanimously voted for our, our climate change uh, strategies at Council Assembly, I, I'm confident that um, green planning must be seen to be responding positively and ensuring that uh, we're playing our part in, in, in the so global effort to um, mitigate the effects of climate change. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Oh, you put the uh, picture back up. I, I believe there were members who indicated. I've just lost my uh, my uh, thing now. Hold on. There we go. I've got Councillor Whitehead and Councillor O'Brien, followed by Councillor O'Brien. Councillor Whitehead, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will start with just asking a point of clarification. So in paragraph 63 of the officer's report, it mentions that the new Southwark plan requires improvements to the accessibility of the um, Southwark tube station. Um, but I wasn't really clear from the report whether that's actually being achieved in practice. Right. Oh, uh, sorry, so your question is? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess my question <laughs> is, is there any measures being put in place to improve accessibility at the tube station? And if so, what are they? As part of this application itself, it's not. There are no proposals to change um, the entry or exit um, of the station. Um, the, the the pavements will be widened around the outside of the station, but the the application itself isn't proposing any alterations to the station. But TfL. The applicant are here tonight and they will be able to give you more information on what their future plans are for um, any improvements to the actual station itself. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, perhaps just as a follow-up, Chair, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, as a technical point then, in terms of what the new Southwark plan says on this, is the new Southwark plan saying that as part of any regeneration of this development, these accessibility changes should be made. I'm having trouble opening that part of the Southwark plan. Um, can I come back to that one um, once I've had a chance yes. to read that part of the? Yes, yes, it's uh, an interesting question. Uh, yeah. uh, we've been missing you, Councillor Whitehead, you see in our early briefing, but it's okay. It's a very good question. Um, uh, Councillor Brian. Right. <laughs> it's okay. Councillor Brian. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the um, Blackfriars SPD says the recommend 70 metres, notwithstanding this building is going slightly higher than that. Is that number fairly arbitrary? And with this building going to 75 metres, under what context do we think that that height is appropriate uh, for the area? Okay, okay. thank you for that question. Attempts? Um, well, one of the design officers might want to step in, but it, 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 I would look at the 70 metres, um, the, the, the SPD is saying that uh, the principle of a building up to that height is acceptable. Um, I don't think we need to we don't need to see that as a, a complete hard and fast, it's more of a guide, but going above the 70 metres by around five metres, you take into account any additional impacts that could stem from that. Does, it ha does that extra five metres result in any incursions into any additional views? Does it have any townscape impacts? 
are there any um, does it have any kind of impacts on the actual design of the building? In this case, it, it didn't. And the, there's a building further south on Blackfriars Road at St George's Circus. I think that's listed in the SPD um, as being an appropriate site for a 70 metre building as well. And I think the building that was constructed there ended up being around 96. Um, but I don't know, Martin might have more information. Um, sorry, I think, yeah, I I think you're misunderstanding the, the my question, I wasn't worried about the 75 metres, I was worried about the context of having a 75 metre building there, given that St George's Circus is a long way away from the cup. So I'm just wondering about why a 75 metre building or 70 metre building okay. has, has context at that location is my real question, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, if I could uh, just elaborate. Uh, thank you, it's Michael Sakaris here. Just to, uh, just to give you some background, um, the 70 metre uh, threshold is not an arbitrary proposal. It, it is included in the um, Blackfriars Road SPD and uh, the, the uh, diagram which sort of underpins that is uh, shown in the uh, officer's report uh, on page um, under, uh, under paragraph 89, which shows how the, um, the idea of um, localized landmarks are appropriate for this southern uh, extent of Blackfriars Road, actually marking either end of the Blackfriars Road in that respect. I can, um, if the committee uh, allows, I'm, I'm, I could share that uh, that uh, diagram, which is on, which is in the officer's report. I'll, I'll do so here. Um, right. If you can, if you can see that, um, it, this is a, an extract uh, from uh, the background paper of of, of that. Um, uh, so in the in the officer's report is an extract uh, from that uh, from that SPD um, a, a modified to show the uh, the uh, scheme at the southern end of Blackfriars Road at at St George's Circus, but also highlighting this site and the uh, and the datums. So what the SPD said um, was for this southern end of the Blackfriars Road. Uh, starting with the Southwark Tube Station and ending with um, Black, uh, St George's Circus, the, uh, it should be marked on either end or bookend at either end by a local landmark. Um, uh, 70 metres was given as a sort of guide, as a, and this was a height that was tested with um, three-dimensional modelling, uh, as well as in, in accordance with, the, um, with Historic England's guidance. Uh, and then... Uh, Either with those two local landmarks at either end, uh, the length of Blackfriars Road that intervenes should rise no more than 30 metres. And that is what was the sort of spatial framework that was set up for this southern end of, uh, of Blackfriars Road. And this is what um, uh, the uh, case officer is, uh, is referring to in the uh, case officer's report as well as um, what, is, uh, uh, what is stated, the, the, the sort of, should we say, the context that, uh, of the Blackfriars Road SPD that, was pre that is being presented to you today. All righty, Katapuan? Yes, no, thank you, Chair. I understand the explanation, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, are there no further questions for the committee? Um, I would move on to the objective, but I'm not going to, if I may. It's nearly half past seven. I said that hourly will take a five minute uh, break. I, I think we'll take the five minute break prior to going on to the objectors. So we will reconvene at, uh, there we go, get the numbers right, at um, 1934. How about that? Okay, <laughs> this is 1934.